Good evening. These days, discoveries are being made in rapid succession. Astronomers have just identified the most remote object ever seen. It's a quasar, and it's about 13,000 million light years away, in which case it should be well out toward the boundary of the observable universe. And I have more to say about that later on. Meanwhile, I want to come much nearer home to the solar system, because both the largest planets are on view. Saturn's on the boundaries of Scorpius, the Scorpion. I'm afraid we are starting to lose it now in the evening twilight, but we can still see it. And if you have a telescope, I suggest you have a look at it, because the ring system is wide open, and I always think that Saturn is the loveliest object in the entire sky. The other giant planet, Jupiter, rises soon after dark, and it's so bright you can't mistake it. And with a telescope, you will naturally see its belts and its moons, even though I'm afraid the great red spot is not very much in evidence at the moment. Now, let's have a look at a plan of the solar system. There we have the Sun in the middle, and the four small planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. Then we have the gap where move the asteroids, or minor planets, and then we have the giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, together with Pluto, which is an odd little world about which I have more to say later on. But notice that the outer planets are very spread out. And if you are going straight from here to the orbit of Neptune, by the time you cross the orbit of Jupiter, you'd only be about one-fifth of the way. Now, before 1781, no one had really given very much thought to the idea of another planet beyond Saturn, because all the bright planets have been known since prehistoric times, naturally. But then, in 1781, a then amateur astronomer named William Herschel, later to become a very great observer, was making a survey of the sky with a homemade telescope when he came across something that wasn't a star and which turned out to be a new planet, uh, the one we call Uranus. You can just about see it with the naked eye if you know where it is, but it's not very bright and frankly I'm not surprised that nobody identified it before Herschel did. People had seen it but had mistaken it for a star. We know quite a lot about Uranus now, because last year the Voyager 2 probe passed by it and sent back close-range pictures. And there is one. Doesn't show very much, I'm afraid, but then Uranus is not nearly so active a world as Jupiter or Saturn. It takes 84 years to get around the Sun, and it's big, very much bigger than the Earth. It's only about half the diameter of Saturn, but it's still a giant, and it has a gaseous surface. Saturn's just over 70,000 miles across, the Earth, of course, just under 8,000, and Uranus about 30,000, so it does rank as a giant world. Now, when a planet is discovered, the first thing that's done is to work out its orbit and the way in which it moves. And this, naturally, was done with Uranus. But after only a few years, it became quite clear that something was badly wrong. Uranus would not behave. It persistently strayed away from its predicted position. Now, all the known planets had been taken into account, so there was some perturbing influence there, and it seemed very likely that this was due to a planet further out which wasn't known. Now, two mathematicians tackled this. In England, John Couch Adams. In France, Urbain de Verrier, who must have been quite a character. He was said to have been one of the very rudest men who's ever lived, and it was also said that he may not have been the most detestable man in France, but he was certainly the most detested. And at one stage, he was even dismissed as director of the Paris Observatory because no one could get on with him, even though uh, when his successor was drowned in a boating accident, the Verriers reinstated. Well, Adams and Le Verrier made independent calculations. They got to much the same answers, and they told the optical astronomers where to look. And on the basis of Le Verrier's calculations, in 1846, astronomers in Berlin found the new planet, now named Neptune, very close to the place where Adams and Le Verrier had predicted. They actually used Le Verrier's calculations. It was a kind of detective problem. They, uh, they knew about the victim, Uranus, and they had to find the culprit. Let's have a look and see just how they worked. Here we have the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. Haven't bothered to put in the closer planets. And in 1781, when Uranus was found, that was the situation, with Neptune ahead of Uranus and tending to pull it along. Still the same in 1800 and in 1810. But in 1822, the three worlds were lined up, Sun, Uranus, and Neptune, and after that, Neptune was lagging behind Uranus and tended to pull Uranus back. And that was the kind of calculation that Adams and Verrier made, and they got it right, and that's where Neptune was found. Also, it turned out to be a giant. It's a bit smaller than Uranus, rather more massive, about 17 times as massive as the Earth, and it takes 164 years to go around the Sun. Uh, we don't know a lot about it yet. 
We're going to know much more, we hope, in 1989, August, because at that stage, the probe Voyager 2, which has already bypassed Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, is scheduled to make a pass of Neptune, and I assure you, the sky is going to cover that very fully. Meanwhile, you might like to see one of the first pictures of Neptune sent back from Voyager 2. And there it is. Of course, that elongation of the globe is due to an instrumental effect, but that is Neptune, and you can also see Neptune's larger satellite, Triton, which must be larger than our moon. Now, that was in 1846, and all seemed well. But was it? There was still something unexplained about the movements of Neptune, and particularly Uranus. So there was a possibility of another planet loomed up. And then, at the turn of the century, along came Percival Lowell. Now, we tend to remember Percival Lowell as a man who believed in intelligent life on Mars, and about that, of course, he was wrong. But he was a great astronomer. He founded the Lowell Observatory at Flagstaff in Arizona, and there's the dome with the great 24-inch refractor, which is one of the best telescopes of its kind in the world, and I know that because in the pre-Apollo days, I used it for moon mapping. Now, Lowell made the same kinds of calculations that Adams and Leverrier had done, only this time, they were even more difficult, because the perturbations were so much smaller. Eventually, Lowell arrived at a position for what he called Planet X, and using his big telescope, he started to look for it. He didn't find it, and when he died in 1916, the new planet was still unfound, and for a long time, nothing much more was done. But then, in 1929, astronomers at the Lowell Observatory went back to the problem, and they enlisted the aid of a then-unknown young amateur named Clyde Tombaugh, and there he is at that stage. Uh, they provided him with a 13-inch telescope, which is still there, and that's a photograph I took of a little while ago, and Clyde Tombaugh was instructed to hunt for the new planet according to Lowell's calculations. He began, and for long, in 1930, uh, he was successful, and he identified the planet we now call Pluto. And there is a picture of Pluto. That large, overexposed blob is, in fact, a star. Actually, it's Delta Geminorum. And there is Pluto at the junction of the two arrows. And um, I do hasten to add that the arrows were put on afterwards. Well, as you can see from that, Pluto looks exactly like a star. I can see it with a telescope in my own observatory, but it is very stellar. And so you can't recognize it as a planet by its appearance. So Clyde Tombaugh worked in a rather different way, and he used photography. What he did in his systematic search was to photograph areas of the sky on, uh, separated by an interval of several nights. Now, the stars are so far away that they don't seem to shift noticeably in relation to each other. But, of course, a planet will. And when you look at a photograph of the same area and flick from one to the other, a stars will seem still, but a planet will seem to jump. And there we see the kind of method that Clyde used. The stars are the same, but you can see Pluto jumping about. And that was the way in which Pluto was identified. I am glad to say that um, Clyde Tombaugh is still very active. He's over 80 now. And in 1980, 50 years after his discovery, there was a special celebration meeting to celebrate it. And uh, there's a picture of Clyde Tombaugh that I took then. And I may say he paid me the very great honor of inviting me to collaborate with him in writing the Pluto book, uh, which I was very honored and delighted to do. So Pluto was found in 1930. And yet still, things were not quite right. And Pluto seemed to be, in many ways, an oddity. First of all, its path was strange. Most of the planetary orbits, including ours, are pretty nearly circular. Pluto's isn't, as you can see from that picture. And uh, for part of its 248-year period, it comes inside the orbit of Neptune. It next reaches perihelion, or closer to the Sun, in 1989, and so between 1979 and 1999, it's actually closer in the Neptune. But there's no fear of collision, because as well as being eccentric, Pluto's orbit is tilted by an angle of 17 degrees, as you can see there. And that, again, is very strange indeed. So Pluto didn't fit in. But even worse, it turned out to be very small. Lowell had expected it to be larger than the Earth, and because it was very much fainter than he expected, was one reason why he didn't find it. In fact, we now know that Pluto is not only smaller than the Earth, it's also smaller than the Moon. It's got a satellite, Charon, and even those two together don't add up to a globe as large as the Moon. Just look at this. There we have Uranus and Neptune, and here, on the same scale, we show Pluto and its satellite. They are our real dwarfs. And you can probably see the implications of that. If Pluto is very small, it can't be massive enough 
to have any measurable effects upon giant planets such as Uranus and Neptune. And yet, it was by those very effects that Lowell had worked out the position, which turned out to be reasonably correct. So there was something very strange about that. Originally, it was thought that Pluto might actually be larger than it appeared. And uh, supposing it had a kind of shiny surface, then it might be that we are measuring not the full diameter of the planet, but merely an area where the sun was reflected. It's what's called specular reflection. We've got a demonstration here to show what's meant. There we have what we actually saw, and as you see more clearly, that's the situation. All we're measuring is a bright part in the center of a shiny globe. But um, I'm afraid that doesn't work, because we now know that Pluto really is small, so that idea has got to be discarded. And if Pluto really is small, and yet is massive enough to perturb giants such as Uranus and Neptune, it would have to be a good many times denser than lead, and that didn't seem reasonable either. So what was the answer? It does seem very much that Pluto can't be the planet that Lowell predicted. All this is very strange, because uh, W. H. Pickering, another American astronomer, had made calculations of the same kind and got the same kind of answer, and actually there had been a brief search in 1919 on the basis of Pickering's calculations. And when Pluto had been found, Pickering's photographs were re-examined, re and uh, Pluto had actually been recorded twice, only by sheer bad luck. On the first occasion, Pluto fell right on top of a star, and on the second occasion, on top of a flaw in the photographic plate. But nevertheless, there was something very strange about it. So does Planet 10 really exist, and can it really be the planet Lowell was predicting? Now, if Planet 10 is there, it must be well out beyond Uranus and Neptune, and even beyond Pluto. It must be a slow mover, and it must be very faint indeed. So, unless we have some idea of where it may be, it's really rather pointless to start hunting for it. Uranus and Neptune haven't really given us a lot of help, so what about comets? Now, comets are very insubstantial things, so they can easily be pulled around by any planets, and some of them go way out beyond any planet known. And the obvious candidate is Halley's Comet, which comes back over 76 years, and we heard a great deal about Halley's Comet last year when it was on view. Now, at its greatest distance from the Sun, Halley's Comet goes out way beyond Neptune. And suppose Planet 10 is there, then it could have an effect upon the motions of Halley's Comet. And this was investigated some years ago by Dr. Brady in America, and he came up with an answer. He believed that there was a planet there, it was affecting Halley's Comet, and he suggested that this planet might be way out beyond Neptune, a massive world, and going around the Sun in a wrong way or retrograde direction. Now, that would be a mathematician's nightmare. We believe that the planets were formed from a cloud of dust and gas surrounding the sun in its early days, and um, just how you get most of the cloud rotating one way and part of it rotating another way is anybody's guess. Dr. Brady actually came up with a position for his supposed planet in the constellation of Cassiopeia, and many people had a look for it. I did myself, because according to his original work, it should have been bright enough to have seen with a telescope such as mine. Well, we didn't find it. And I think we now know that those calculations weren't sound and that Dr. Brady's planet doesn't exist. So, Halley's Comet on this occasion doesn't seem to be much use. Where do we go next? Luckily, we have some man-made vehicles which could come to the rescue. Two pioneers and two voyagers, both of which are on their way out of the solar system. The pioneers were first, and here's an impression of Pioneer 10. It might equally well be Pioneer 11 because they were identical twins. And both these were Jupiter probes, but they ended up by having rather different paths. Pioneer 10 actually bypassed Jupiter and then simply went on into space, and it's now penetrated beyond the orbit of Neptune. Pioneer 11 also passed Jupiter a year later, but it did have some power left, and it was diverted back across the solar system to a rendezvous with Saturn before it too started to go out into space. So those two pioneers are leaving the solar system in opposite directions. And I just wonder, if Planet 10 is there, could it have an effect upon the pioneers? And I do remember making a suggestion to that effect in a sky and night program 15 or 16 years ago. Nothing very original about it, because after all, it was a fairly obvious idea. But some very interesting work is now being carried out in America by Dr. John Anderson and his colleagues, and they've come up with some new ideas. Just suppose that Planet 10 is there, but has a very inclined orbit, so it goes around at something like a right angle to the other planets in a very long period between 700 and 1,000 years. 
In that case, when planet 10 is close in, it could presumably have a noticeable effect upon Uranus, Neptune, or the pioneers, and when far out, clearly it wouldn't. Now, at the moment, no effects upon Pioneer 10 have been found, despite very careful checks, and that gives a kind of limit to the possible mass of Planet 10 if it's anywhere within range. It can hardly be more than five times as massive as the Earth. On the other hand, what about Uranus and Neptune? It does seem that in the last century, there were noticeable, although tiny, effects. Since 1910, these have not been seen, and so possibly, therefore, Planet 10 has now moved temporarily out of range, and in the future, it could start to have effects again, and could even affect the pioneers or the voyagers when they get there. And that could be one way of identifying Planet 10, although, of course, it is something of a long shot, and it's all very speculative, but it's to be a definite chance. Well, finally, let me end with a bit of fun and some ideas of my own, and please don't take them very seriously. I'm starting uh, with the assumption that Lowell's reasonable prediction uh, was not very far wide of the mark. It wasn't sheer luck, in fact. In that case, if Pluto is not the planet Lowell was hunting for, and it seems quite definite that it wasn't, then the real planet 10 may have been in the same part of the sky at the same time, so at least we start with something. Now let's assume uh, that it's um, beyond Neptune. In the solar system, we have a kind of relationship called Bode's Law, which links the positions of the planets. It did predict a planet between Mars and Jupiter, which of course isn't there, but the asteroids are. And so, could there be another asteroid belt beyond Neptune? Possible, but I think rather unlikely, because even if put together, the asteroids wouldn't add up to a body as massive as the Moon, and couldn't have any effects on Uranus or Neptune. But suppose, then, that Planet 10 is about as far beyond Neptune as Uranus is inside. Also, assume that Planet 10 is about as massive as Uranus and Neptune. And finally, assume that, like most of the other planets, its orbit is not very highly inclined to the ecliptic. Now, if you make all those assumptions, and you have a reasonable idea of where it may be in 1930, you can work out its mean daily motion and arrive at a guess as to where it may be now. And having done that, I come to a position in the constellation of Leo of the Lion marked by the bright star Regulus. And if the planet's orbit is not very inclined, it can't be very far from the ecliptic, and um, I've come to a position somewhere near the star Chi Leonis. Now, please take all that with a very large grain of cosmic salt. I've started off with a totally unproved assumption that Lowell's prediction wasn't luck, and I've gone on to make a series of further assumptions, every one of which is itself rather inherently improbable. But all the same, if Planet 10 is eventually found, and it does prove to have been somewhere around Leo at about this time, I think I'll give myself a modest pat on the back. But coming back to more serious calculations, I think that Dr. Anderson's work may give us at last a clue. If Planet 10 exists, it must be lonely and desolate beyond our understanding, intensely cold, and always so far away from the sun that even the sun itself will appear as no more than a tiny point of light. But if it's there, we may find it one day, and even Pioneer 10 might eventually lead us to it. And I, for one, firmly believe that Planet 10 is out there somewhere. Good night.